Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would like to continue on with our discussion of the films that are included in this set, which is called Pioneers of African American Cinema. And this is the Blu-ray set that I have from Kino Classics. It is a fine set, strongly, strongly recommended. And it's been my great pleasure to have been able to speak about a number of the films included in this series in separate videos on this channel. Today, let us focus our attention on the film from 1926, which is called Ten Nights in a Bar Room. This is directed by Roy Kalnick uh, from Colored Players Film Corporation, and this stars Charles Gilpin as the main character, Joe Morgan. So this is a very interesting work for a number of reasons. I think for uh, first and foremost, we have a story that is a... Uh, a story that is dealing with a main character and a family drama. It's also dealing with human tragedy and suffering. It is a temperance story. In other words, it is a story that deals with alcoholism and the results of alcoholism set forth against the backdrop of a human drama story. And we have the idea of, of the bar room and all the vices that are uh, that are associated with that symbol again set forth in the backdrop of the story and then we have all the human interconnections that take place this tapestry of human drama that takes place uh, in and around this particular community so this is essentially the film Ten Nights in a Bar Room from 1926. Now, it is very significant also, again, in the context of pioneers of African-American cinema, in that we have a film that has an uh, African-American cast, headed, of course, by the legend, the great Charles Gilpin. And we have a story that is not overtly and directly dealing with the types of situations involving race and race relations that we might have seen, say, in the silent film era of the filmmaker Oscar Micheaux, which we discussed earlier in separate videos. Instead, what we have is a community that is dealing with the issues of of the economics, the issues of, as I say, temperance, the effects of alcoholism and vices, the idea of the, the pull between temptation and family, how religion plays into that. We have also the day-to-day -day interactions among characters, uh, certain romantic inclinations that develop and blossom among certain characters, and then we have the core family element that's very important important to uh, the characters in particular, Joe Morgan in particular. And so this is, in essence, a human drama, a very powerful human drama with many different facets to it. But anchoring it at the center, as I say, is the performance by Charles Gilpin as Joe Morgan. And we have what is a truly phenomenal performance by a truly phenomenal actor, one of the great actors of his age. And he is delivering a performance that is both uh, raw and bold and very physical on the one hand. And then at the same time, it is very tender and sweet and sensitive on the other. And it is a performance that really uh, lays bare and exposes the type of insecurities and weaknesses, uh, temptations, uh, the temptation towards vices, and how that, uh, in particular alcohol and drink, and ultimately how that affects him directly 
as a person, as a father, as a family man, and as a human being, and the kinds of ramifications that has on him both directly and also uh, long term. And it is a very interesting set of developments that uh, confronts this particular character in a heavily dramatic way. Uh, so this is the performance by Charles Gilpin as Joe Morgan, one of the great performances from one of the great performers uh, in this film, Ten Nights in a Barroom. While we're on the topic of Charles Gilpin, I should mention a very significant aspect of this film and the way in which Charles Gilpin's presence makes it quite a significant one in the context of a discussion of African-American cinema that is included in this set and that we have seen thus far, in particular as it relates to Paul Robeson and The Emperor Jones and Body and Soul and Oscar Michaud, etc. And so as some of you may know, this is this story, Ten Nights in a Barroom, is derived from a novel. It's referred to as a temperance novel from 1854, Timothy Shea Arthur. And this, in turn, was adapted into a stage play uh, in 1858, William W. Pratt. And so this became the basis for this particular film version. And there have been other film versions as well, but this became the basis for the film version that we have here, the 1926 version, again, starring Charles Gilpin. Charles Gilpin. And so what we have is an interesting parallel. And Included in this set, we have yet another great uh, introductory talk, supplement, with Professor Charles Musser. And he talks about the notion of films having dialogues with each other. In other words, there are relations and there are connections that emerge between separate films based on, for example, a common shared set of circumstances from which those films are derived. Or maybe it is a common sense of a sort of a competitive rivalry that emerges because of similar sets of circumstances, whether they be based in the industry or maybe based in more personal reasons, etc. Uh, and these dialogues can emerge also uh, critically on the critical level based on, for instance, a uh, shared or common or maybe contrasting uh, thematic uh, basis in which the relevant films exist. And many more examples and circumstances can arise in order to create what can be termed to be dialogues between films and circumstances and the like. So what Charles Musser and what other critics and historians have uh, remarked about is the fact that we have here in this film Charles Gilpin and Charles Gilpin is working with material that has its roots in, as I say, uh, the underlying novel and also stage adaptations. And so parallels, I think, can be drawn uh, with the fact that Charles Gilpin himself was a, an actor of the theater. As some of you may know, he was the actor that, in essence, originated the role of Emperor Jones on the stage, the Eugene O'Neill play. And it was through a certain set of circumstances, of course, where Charles Gilpin uh, was, in essence, uh, replaced by uh, Paul Robeson. And then Paul Robeson really took the role and had it his own. Uh, to the extent that he played, Paul Robeson did, played the uh, the role of Emperor Jones in the subsequent film adaptation of the play, Emperor Jones. And so, uh, and then of course we have Paul Robeson appearing in the Oscar Michaud film, Body and Soul. And we've discussed in a separate video on Body and Soul, the idea of Paul Robeson and what he represents in his uh, in the fact that he is in that film, not just in terms of the role or roles that he plays in that film, of course, but also his 
the, the kind of baggage that he brings as uh, the actor that he was uh, from the theater and the specific works that he engaged in in the theater. And when we come to this film, Ten Nights in a Barroom, that kind of history uh, really, it, it's very relevant, I think, in a, a reading of this film. In other words, we have Charles Gilpin and Paul Robeson. And Paul Robeson in uh, Body and Soul, and Paul Robeson appeared in that. And so that was a cinematic uh, reworking, if you will, or adaptation of pre-existing uh, stage material. And then here, Ten Nights in a Barroom, we have Charles Gilpin, a kind of maybe acting rival perhaps with Paul Robeson in many respects, here working in a film which is in its own way a cinematic adaptation of an underlying novel and stage work. And so I think the parallel there is very striking. Also we are reminded further that Charles Gilpin as an actor when he was uh, in the role of the Emperor Jones, and he originated it and made it his own. It's been uh, m uh, noted in uh, historical record and also in essays, including uh, the essay found in the booklet that's included here in the Kino Classics set about how Charles Robeson, I'm sorry, about Charles Gilpin, excuse me, how Charles Gilpin would change dialogue that was found in the stage play of the Emperor Jones. As some of you may know, there are some moments in the stage version where the N-word uh, appears in certain parts, and uh, Charles Gopin very famously refused to use those that language and instead change those words. And uh, it was remarked also that Eugene O'Neill was very upset about this, uh, what he considered to be the alterations of his particular underlying uh, play. So we understand that there was a kind of, of iron, irony employed when Oscar Michaud cast uh, Paul Robeson, as he did in Body and Soul, this idea that Paul Robeson, uh, right, his presence seemed in, in and of itself to be a, a, a point in which Oscar Michaud was making in his film, and to the point where uh, Charles Musser also remarks that Paul Robeson did not necessarily know the the ironic twist that Oscar Michaud was, uh, was relying on when he cast Paul Robeson in that film, such to the point where much later, uh, when Paul Robeson realized what was going on in that film, it seems like, again, according to Charles Musser, uh, there was a, a period in Paul Robeson's life where he, uh, in essence, uh, tried to distance himself from body and soul uh, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, But with Charles Gilpin, I think the comparisons uh, with uh, Paul Robeson, I think, become very, very, uh, very striking. And so we come to a film like Ten Nights in a Barroom, where we have the a film that is not necessarily directly dealing with race relations or miscegenation or the color line uh, as employed by, uh, by Charles Musser uh, in his analysis. But uh, we do have uh, the underlying... Uh, intertextual uh, significance of Charles Gilpin. And it does remind us of the role that Charles Gilpin did play in terms of the theater world and in terms of the uh, movie world. And there is therefore a certain sense of dignity and there is a certain sense of authority and trust that we see in Charles Gilpin's performance. I think not just directly on the screen, it's there of course, it's there quite strikingly, but also in what he brings based on his own biography and the way in which uh, we know that he tried in his own way, again, when he was playing Emperor Jones on stage, he tried in his own way to uh, show a kind of resistance. And in that way, he tried to establish a sense of human dignity and nobility in the way that he was playing that particular role, Emperor Jones. And so this kind of aura brings itself along when Charles Gilpin is in this film. And it makes his performance all the more beautiful and brilliant and poignant, especially considering that his character 
Joe Morgan, when we think about his character, we think about the plights of his character, right? And how uh, the alcohol has really led to his downfall, right? But there are other aspects of that related, of course. But the idea that there is a, an economic impact uh, due to his circumstances in the immediate past, he seems to have lost uh, certain economic opportunities because of this. And so that's one thing. The other thing too, it's tied to a sense of human dignity. And the, the film charts his attempts at trying to maintain a sense of human dignity, whether it be through family or, or other that. means. And challenges are made to that sense of human dignity and to the point where he is really challenged, his character is really challenged, uh, quite shockingly so in the way that the film uh, 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 unfurls its narrative, right? As you know, uh, for those of you who've seen the film. And so this notion of his character and human dignity and how it's tied to uh, economic situation and also how human dignity itself e is either challenged or it's reinforced and through the reinforcement of things like family and religion and community and the like and so these traits I think are very significant in the type of overall shall we say a uh, struggle or challenges uh, that I think uh, can be said to have been uh, part of, of, let's say, uh, part of the, the experience, shall we say, uh, outside of the film itself. And when we think of the episodes of Charles Gilpin and the Emperor Jones and Eugene O'Neill and the play, uh, and his work there, I think we can see that there, this idea of human dignity and nobility, it's really transferred quite brilliantly uh, just by the presence of Charles Gilpin himself on the screen. And so uh, this all ties in uh, so, so uh, wonderfully. Again, the context of the film itself, the, the textual reading of the film, it's a very much a human drama. In some senses, it's kind of like a melodrama. In other senses, it's a very tragic human tale. And in other senses, it's, it's, it's almost like a there are some action set pieces and some really spectacular set pieces at, at the end there. Uh, and so uh, there, there's a lot of, of, of there are a lot of, of um, aspects to the film itself within the text. But when we think beyond the text and we think outside of the text, we realize that there is a lot going on and that has to do primarily with the presence of Charles Gilpin. And I should say also, just in passing, of course, uh, this film, Ten Nights in a Barroom, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't feature Paul Robeson, of course. Uh, and I don't want to suggest uh, anything, I don't want to cast any negative aspersions about Paul Robeson uh, necessarily. And so what I would suggest, if you are interested, I would suggest uh, just reading up on Paul Robeson or uh, checking out some of the materials about Paul Robeson because his career itself is very, very fascinating in and of itself. And it's uh, it deserves a lot of attention. Uh, and so if you're interested, uh, please check some of those materials out. Uh, for example, there are some materials made available in the Criterion Collection, some documentaries, for instance, in a nice DVD. DVD box set about Paul Robeson's films, as well as a really interesting uh, set of supplements about Paul Robeson in the Criterion Collection release of the film Showboat, just in case you're interested. Uh, but uh, going back, therefore, to this film, Ten Nights in a Barroom, I think we can safely say that we have a, as I say, a really powerful drama that is real, that is led by a powerful performance uh, by the great Charles Gilpin. And when you see this film, and hopefully you can get a chance to see it again and again, please pay attention to his nuances, the his charm, and also the way that he can turn the types of choices that he makes as an actor both physically and emotionally is very powerful stuff, very, very powerful stuff. And it is brilliant. Uh, and uh, it's one of those, it's, it's, we're so fortunate that this film exists so that we can still enjoy the greatness that was, uh, that is Charles Gilpin. Uh, wonderful stuff, my friends. 
And then I should say, lastly, that this is a film that is made by Color Players of Philadelphia. And if you, again, if you uh, read a little bit about this, uh, you, it'll say that this was headed by David Starkman, uh, who is described as a Jewish theater owner and small-time film distributor who worked closely with black theatrical uh, impresario Sherman H. Dudley. And it goes on to say, Colored Players of Philadelphia produced four films between 1926 and 1929. Its first three films were directed by Jewish emigre Roy Kalnick, whose previous credits included black cast films Smiling Hate, 1924, and the two real comedies Step in High, 1924, as well as the Yiddish uh, Abbey's Imported Bride, 1925. And this is The Colored Player's second and earliest surviving feature, Ten Nights in a Bar Room. And uh, it, is a, it is a really fascinating set of circumstances by which this film is made. And again, we have a film that, as I mentioned, does not directly, in its, the context of its story, deal with head-on with race relations and the like, but I think implicitly we have that story emerge. And I think also, most importantly, what we have is first and foremost, and ultimately and universally, we have a story that is about human beings and, uh, and their uh, and family and love and triumph and disaster and how the characters and how the community deals with all this in all their various facets and it's very powerful very moving and the way it ends is also quite startling to the point of being very very emotional uh, and so this is i think what we have again both in terms of the directness of the text itself and then also when we step back and we look beyond the text we see i think a very rich full and uh, brilliantly conceived work uh, from this period, 1926. This is the film Ten Nights in a Bar Room. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. And so I will continue on with the films in this series, Pioneers of African American Cinema. I hope that uh, I can see you at the next video. In the meantime, of course, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much again for your time, as always, my friends, and cheers.